am so excited to be at the very beginning of this five-year doctoral project, um, as Stephen said, supervised by Wade Davis and Zachary Walsh, um, who really unfortunately couldn't speak today. Um, so over the next five years, we really aim to create the definitive statement on the San Pedro cactus, which has not been explored uh, a whole lot uh, in the academic literature. So um, we really come into this with a conviction that the past can inform the present, even, though, uh, even as the present can be our only window into the past. So we'll be investigating both its modern potential as a medicine that brings about psychological healing and also its ancient role in uh, Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, which is what I'll be talking about today. So over the course of my months working with San Pedro in the Andes over the last couple years, uh, it's become very evident that the symbolic world uh, of the plant is inseparable from the living world of the Andes Mountains. So San Pedro is native to the foothills of the Andes uh, in Peru and Ecuador with related species found as far south as Bolivia. The Andes are the highest tropical mountains in the world, uh, but they're not untouched wilderness. Grassy m valleys are mowed down to bare roots by llamas and alpacas and horses. And, you know, right up to the snow line uh, where isolated stone huts nestle in impossibly high valleys. Only the Apus, the glaciated peaks revered as gods, uh, are out of reach of humans. On the flanks of the mountains, there's the constant thunder that melting glaciers make, more feeling than sound as car-sized chunks of ice scatter over the grass. The earth is always moving there, quite literally, as the Nazca Oceanic Plate crashes silently into South America, making the Andes some of the fastest growing mountains on earth. They're dotted with young volcanoes and rattled by earthquakes. Landslides are common and devastating, sometimes burying whole villages. Chaos is God in this unpredictable world where one in three crops fails each year. These extremes ensure that ritual is not a static force in the Andean communities. Building bridges from chaos to order is not a trivial task, nor one entrusted to only a subset of the community. Each person, each day, takes responsibility for maintaining the cosmic order. Gratitude is not an abstract concept, but a way of life. Every journey is blessed, every tool consecrated before it digs into the earth, every house built on a sacred pact with the land. Coca leaves infused with prayers are offered to the earth every day. When a bottle of alcohol so valuable in the Andes is open, the first sip always goes to Pachamama the Earth Mother. This reciprocal exchange of energy between humans and the land brings the balance that is foundational to highland life. The sacred give and take acts as the heartbeat of the Andes, pumping life into the landscape until every stone and stream is animated with the blood of spirit. Without movement, there is chaos. Or, sorry. <laughs> Um, without movement, there is death. Without reciprocity, there is chaos. The, the definition of life is oscillation around a balance point, a homeostatic dance between the complementary forces of giving and taking. So this is the world that San Pedro brings alive for those who work with the plant. Huachuma is the name given to the cactus in Quechua, the native language of the Andes. It's most often translated as dizzy, which sort of reinforces this notion that the cactus makes you go mad, hallucinate, lose equilibrium. This was the view of the colonial chroniclers who wrote about the plant in the 16th century, and it's from their influence that the name San Pedro comes. The Catholic Saint Peter, of course, holds the keys to heaven's gate. In contrast to this idea of dizziness, uh, most people who work with San Pedro will tell you that the plant is all about creating balance between forces of good and evil, inner and outer, masculine and feminine, resolving the inner and the outer to equilibrium, restoring true justice. When indigenous people take medicine, it's generally not to transform themselves or their communities, it's not to become, it is to return balance where the balance has been lost. A more accurate translation 
of Wachuma is decapitated. The medicine is the symbolic sacrificial knife that loosens us from the grip of our sacrificial or of our um, obsessive thinking. Um, We live in our heads, and that makes us crazy. San Pedro is more concerned with our hearts. So San Pedro is a mescaline cactus, just like peyote. Mescaline is a phenethylamine, which is a different chemical class from the tryptamines found in mushrooms and ayahuasca. It's actually more chemically related to MDMA than it is to the tryptamine hallucinogens. So chopped and boiled cactus is strained uh, into a bitter brew with a sort of snotty texture, like a health drink. It's wonderful. <laughs> uh, you really get used to it. It's like a kale smoothie. Um, <laughs> so when I take San Pedro, the first thing I usually feel is the plant searching through my body, cleaning. If there's a lot of cleaning to do, purging can happen, but it's not a guarantee as with ayahuasca. After this initial cleaning phase, there comes an intense and energetic clarity, which lasts eight or 10 hours for some people uh, and a lifetime for others. The Peruvian healer Eduardo Calderon, quoted by Douglas Sharon, uh, describes it as a great vision, a clearing of all the faculties of the individual, a type of visual force inclusive of all the senses, including the sixth sense, the telepathic sense of transporting oneself across time and matter. This visionary state is a landscape of interconnected symbols populated by animals and entities where matter becomes energy and time and space are as malleable as wet clay. And yet it's not a journey into another world, but a deepening into the very fabric of this one with a sense that this sunlit and humming landscape has existed just below the surface for all of time. In this state, there's also an incredible ability to look at and reconfigure the parts that make up the self. So again, the healer Eduardo Calderon uh, describes how the subconscious of the individual is opened up like a flower and it releases blockages. More than anything, the world of San Pedro is a world infused with significance and meaning. It has shown me that our actions and intentions have impact, and it's our personal responsibility to cultivate our worlds with care and to balance our giving and taking. It's not easy to interpret these visionary states using words, uh, and attempting to do so often misses the point. Luckily, thousands of years of human intelligence has gone into navigating the many psychological worlds of San Pedro. These cultures didn't need written language to convey their experiences. They carved them into stone. They wove them into textiles. They inscribed them on the desert floor. They spun myths with the spider silk of the spirit world and passed them on in the oral tradition to future generations. These weren't fanciful illustrations, they were recorded knowledge. They weren't beauty or intricacy for their own sake. They were the language of the collective cultural mind, a language that can serve as script for our understanding of visionary symbols. So tracking down the origins of visionary plant use is famously tricky. Uh, vegetable matter degrades quickly and even if it survives or is represented iconographically, it's hard to unequivocally determine whether and how uh, plants were used. So it was astonishing to all concerned when in 1972 the excavations of Luis Lumbreras um, unearthed this particular low relief carving in an ancient ceremonial center nestled in the Andes between forest and sea. Um, so embodying characteristics of eagle, jaguar, and serpent this is a full united being traveling freely between human and God, living and dead. This particular carving is 3,300 years old. And in the decades since this carving was unearthed, dried fragments of cactus have been found in coastal areas that uh, date the ceremonial use of San Pedro to at least 4,000 years. 
Lumbreras and his team were part of the long series of excavations that uncovered one of the greatest mysteries in South American archaeology, Chavin de Huantar, the main ceremonial center of the Chavin culture, which flourished throughout the Andes at that time. These low relief carvings are beautiful examples of the novel artistic style pioneered by the Chavin culture. And novel is really an understatement because at precisely the time that San Pedro showed up, everything was changing in the Andes. Chavin was the first sophisticated civilization of the Andes, the first defined artistic style, the first monumental architecture. Ceramics were invented, irrigation was invented, llamas were domesticated, and the first uniting empire of the Andes was born. This period of time was called the Chavin horizon, invoking images of a culture that rose like the sun from the void, and it did. This culture had no written language, but their art and architecture tell the story of a world soaked in the green juice of San Pedro, with really little division between the human and the supernatural. Chavin was located, uh, Chavin de Huantar was located at the confluence of two rivers called a Tinque in Quechua. The same word, Tinque, uh, describes the concept of opposing forces meeting in harmony. And the entire site is seen to be an expression of harmonious dualism. The very word Chavin comes from the word for center in Quechua, the fulcrum between order and chaos, human and spirit. At Chavin de Huantar, you can actually enter the dark underground labyrinths that snake below ritual courtyards um, and have some alone time with this 15-foot stone obelisk. Um, that pierces earth and sky in the center of the labyrinth. Uh, it's the Lanzon, the Axis Mundi of the Andes, the principal cult image of the site. With one hand raised and one hand lowered, this god is considered to be the very face of uniting opposites. Here she is represented again, holding a conch shell in one hand and a spondylus uh, shell in the other, which are widely considered to uh, re represent female and male polarities. And it happens to be this very being that is shown in profile in the carved depiction of the San Pedro bearing supernatural uh, that I showed a few slides ago. So, Chavin de Huantar really appears to have been a pilgrimage site where people from far and wide in the Andes would travel to gain illumination. And it's not hard to see how such a journey to meet such a plant could have inspired the lives of the ancient people. The Runakuna have been pilgrims since their ancestors migrated in waves from the north 15,000 years ago and formed nomadic groups that migrated with the seasons. Today, tens of thousands of native Andeans every year make pilgrimages to sacred sites in the mountains, tracing the ancient paths, following maps of meaning drawn by myth and colored by experience. So it's no surprise that Chavin was a culture of pilgrims. This map shows the extent of Chavin influence uh, in Peru. And all of these sites were connected by footpaths, which is quite impressive when you consider that the distance from the far north to the far south of this empire's reach is equivalent from the distance from Vancouver to San Francisco, California. But here's where the mystery gets even stranger. There's no evidence of even basic defensive structures at Chavin de Huantar or most of the other Chavin influenced ceremonial sites. They were at crossroads, many people visited them and they contained artifacts of great value, but there was no evidence that these sites were physically protected in any way. Conflict and weaponry were very rarely depicted in the art of this period. The civilization was not built on conquering and warfare, it was built on belief. Consider what it would take for economic and social structures to thrive peacefully for 1,500 years. For lack of a better explanation, scholars have generally hypothesized that this stability arose from religious strategic manipulation, that the massive Chavin empire was ruled by a group of shaman elite who held enormous coercive power over the common people by terrifying them into submission. San Pedro, if it is mentioned, is cited as just another manipulative tool. But dismissing what today's experience shows us to be a powerful and life-altering psychedelic doesn't quite add up here. 
Powerful visionary plants are not a side dish at the feast of a culture. They are the wine and the bread, and they're foundational in establishing the worldview of people who use them. There's no doubt that the beliefs and cosmology that govern the Andean way of being today were born with Chavin. But where did Chavin come from? This was a culture in balance. It was not just art or architecture, not just shamanism, and the manipulation hypothesis seems oversimplified. Chavin was the fluorescence of an idea, the birth of a symbolic cosmology that gave meaning to life, a uniting religion that swept the creative potential of the Andes to its greatest heights, never rivaled in its intensity before or since. What if Andean culture was born from a San Pedro vision? The idea that San Pedro was the catalyst for the Chavin fluorescence was first suggested by Wade Davis in his wonderful 1998 essay, Cactus of the Four Winds, and it merits further exploration. Over the next several years, we'll be asking how the history of the Andes would look if San Pedro were front and center. So uh, by the time of the birth of Christ, Chavin had more or less disintegrated for reasons completely unknown to us today. In its place rose a succession of fairly short-lived coastal cultures uh, with now famous ceramic traditions, most notably Moche, uh, but also Salinar, Nazca, Paracas, and Chimu. San Pedro certainly didn't disappear with Chavin, and it was depicted in the art of all of these cultures, both in explicit botanical descriptions, both columnar and sliced, and in more subtle visionary symbols, such as spirals and geometric patterns, uh, as noted by the anthropologist Douglas Sharon, who's done most of the work um, on North Coastal ethnoarchaeology. So the cactus is most often shown in associations with uh, felines, deer, uh, and hummingbirds. During the time of the coastal cultures, virtually every ceramic that showed uh, San Pedro depicted with a human uh, depicted this hooded woman who seems to represent a healer archetype. The image of this woman appeared in various cultures for at least a millennium, often holding in her hand a tip of a San Pedro cactus, considered by modern healers to be the most powerful part of the plant. Here, the San Pedro woman is uh, shown suckling a baby at one breast and a length of San Pedro cactus at the other. Men in these coastal cultures were often depicted with magical objects and in shamanic scenes, but virtually never with the cactus. San Pedro seems to have been the exclusive domain of women who cared for the health of individuals and families. And the role of men seems to have been separate and oriented toward managing the society and the state. These ceramics stand in contrast to Shavin iconography, which most often represented shamanic beings um, embodying both female and male characteristics in the harmonious blending of opposites. There's certainly a move from the harmonious to the oppositional between Shavin and the decapitator god worshipping Moche. This also seems to co coincide with a shift in the role of San Pedro, uh, which is explicitly represented in the club heads that were used in physical and metaphysical battles. But nevertheless, these cultures thrived, populating coastal valleys and producing rich artistic traditions and brilliant innovations in agriculture right up until the end. The wave of disease hit Peru even before the Spanish landed in 1528. And there is a concept in the Andes called Pachacuti, inversion of time space. The closest translation in our language is apocalypse. Between the disease and the brutality, nine out of 10 people died in the years following the conquest. Anyone who survived and was caught using San Pedro was convicted of devil worship punished for the heretical notion that heaven can be glimpsed from earth. The conquistadors weren't trying to erase San Pedro, they were trying to annihilate the soul of a people. San Pedro was just one more justifiable excuse for violence. San Pedro used didn't threaten the Catholic God, it threatened the authority of those who wielded their concept of God as a weapon, shedding the blood of those they put beneath them. 
So for 300 years, the only voices that spoke of San Pedro were colonial chroniclers. Um, and then for 150 years, there was silence. San Pedro use was driven underground, but it didn't disappear. It only retreated into mystery for a while, as it does. So today, a renowned healing cult flourishes in north coastal Peru that incorporates San Pedro as one of its main sacraments, along with other herbal medicines. It centers on the village of Huancabamba uh, and the nearby sacred lakes of Las Guaringas. There, San Pedro ceremonies take the form of all-night rituals, generally held on Tuesdays and Fridays. Predominantly male healers called curanderos divine, diagnose, and treats all kinds of ailments, uh, ranging from ill health to bad luck in business to marriage issues. Under this system, most ailments are believed to have a spiritual cause at their root. So if the sickness is particularly bad, the patient may take a pilgrimage to the lakes of Las Huaringas for ritual cleansing. Over the course of an all-night ceremony, patients may be induced to vomit, doused with holy water and alcohol, and massaged or beaten with staffs, stones, and whips, uh, all in the name of expulsing evil forces. In curing the patient, curanderos undertake astral battles to send the curses back the way of the brujo who cast them. As you can imagine, this creates quite a paranoid environment and a lot of competition between curanderos, especially since these treatments can cost hundreds of dollars. The knowledge of curanderos is carefully guarded, passed only from master to apprentice. My first teacher came from this tradition, although he later left it. Uh, and he explained to me that in this healing system, the curandero holds all of the power to diagnose and cure the patient. During the rituals, the patients generally drink small amounts of San Pedro, uh, if any. Instead, the plant is a divinatory tool for the healer. Patients often leave these encounters saying, San Pedro no me pega, San Pedro doesn't hit me. But that's because in this tradition, the goal is not for the plant to work directly with the patient. Instead, the curandero is the patient's conduit to the divine. So in his 1998 essay, Wade Davis observed that this relationship strongly resembles the roles of priest and parishioner found in the Catholic Church uh, as brought by the Spanish. And other elements of these ceremonies are reminiscent of the Catholic ideas um, brought to Peru. The curandero's power is stored in a central altar called a mesa, a, a woven cloth that rests on the earth and holds various power objects statues, icons, bones, stones, crystals, staffs, swords, crosses, amulets, herbs, candles, and sacred water. Often ancient artifacts from tombs are included in the mesa as these lend great power to the curandero. He can call this power into action at will, to heal someone, to achieve a desired outcome, to curse or kill somebody. That will is usually for sale. Some curanderos work in the light of God, with mesas full of symbols of Christ and the Virgin, and their guiding principles are set forth in the Bible and at Sunday Mass. Others have made pacts with the devil to gain power. Most fall somewhere in between. The layout of the mesa itself, interestingly enough, um, embodies the concepts of Andean sacred geography that were born with Shavin. Douglas Sharon and Donald Joroman in the 70s described the common arrangement of the altars. They're divided into two opposing fields, the Campo Ganadero on the left and the Campo Justiciera on the right, uh, where the tool or tools of the healer live, and then on the left are the perceived evil objects. Um, so in the center, uh, there's the Campo Medio, the balancing field, and this is where San Pedro lives. If there's an imbalance uh, between good and evil as it manifests in illness or bad luck, it's the curandero's job with the plant to restore balance to the mesa, to the patient's life, and to the earth. This way of working occurs with or without the aid of San Pedro, and indeed many curanderos don't use the plant. As the healer Eduardo Calderon often repeated, the plant is a catalyst the force that opens the door a little or a lot for the curandero's own innate power to flow. It links him to the power of the objects under his control and to the energy of his clients. 
So it's impossible to say whether any remnants of ancient practices surrounding San Pedro survived the conquest, or if they did, which parts of the ritual remain constant. We'll probably never know. But regardless, examining this particular healing cult does not give the full measure of San Pedro or how it has been used or how it should be used. The tradition is thoroughly mestizo and the dominance of Catholic ideas seems to be complete. In a way, it's an exciting prospect that there is no rigidly defined ancient tradition for working with San Pedro. It leaves us with so much opportunity for creative and respectful novelty. San Pedro does have realistic potential for widespread use since it already grows all over the world um, and also on this stage, which is wonderful. Um, <laughs> they're wonderful to have around. I really encourage you to um, bring home a San Pedro friend if you can. So San Pedro really doesn't have the same sustainability issues that we see with ayahuasca and peyote. Um, and it's not yet world famous or overexploited. This means we have great opportunity moving forward to guide its touristic journey in a loving way uh, and care for its sustainability. So next September, the world's first forum on San Pedro will happen in Southern Ecuador uh, with our focus on developing cactus sustainability projects. Uh, and we'll also hopefully uh, produce a set of ethical guidelines for working with the plant. The other project that is on the near horizon is the uh, first academic study of San Pedro's uh, potential as a therapeutic aid, which my co-supervisor Zach Walsh and I will undertake in the coming months. So I'll spend this December collecting stories of San Pedro experiences in ceremonial context in Peru and Ecuador and analyze them for common threads of meaning. So we're not trying to reduce these experiences down to numbers or over-conceptualize them. Stories themselves have incredible power to touch hearts and inspire change, and that's really where we aim to take this storytelling project with San Pedro. And I really look forward in the next several years to examining the breadth of new ways people are working with San Pedro that are rooted in what we know about ancient practices but are relevant for people now. In the Sacred Valley near Machu Picchu, uh, San Pedro is newly being used in traditional Quechua land honoring practices, connecting people with Pachamama. In Cusco, the combination of San Pedro with electronic music pioneered by Muyu sessions is birthing musical innovation as well as transforming the lives of people with alcohol and cocaine addictions. In southern Ecuador, there's a trend toward using San Pedro in sweat lodges called Temascals. In Bolivia, the San Pedro long dance is proliferating in a synergy between native North American dance and traditional Bolivian San Pedro rituals. Um, so really what this comes down to though is that ceremony is often co-opted by orthodoxy as we've already observed with San Pedro. And in our empirical culture where science does not keep house with the sacred, it's understandable that we reach for and often idealize native rituals. But the pure indigenous tradition is fantasy. Indigeneity does not imply homogeny, quite the opposite actually. So seeking to imitate the image of the sacred does not bring us any closer to the shared human goal of infusing our lives with meaning. There was a time when people walked hundreds of kilometers through the mountains to learn from San Pedro. And the visions and insights that they gained inspired monumental architecture, novel and complex art, and peaceful cooperation. Later, the plant was used as a weapon, a means of exercising power over others, and today in Peru, a financial living. All of these roles played by the plant can be called indigenous traditions and all can undoubtedly be played out again. Good and evil are both possible with the plant and both valid. It's what transcends those opposites that the plant represents. Critically, the goal is not the triumph of good over evil, but the return of balance between them. So one moment I'll remember for the rest of my life was the very first time I placed my forehead against the crown of a cactus. Opposites were annihilated. The doors of duality literally melted from their hinges and I was plunged into pure infinity. And the only words I have to describe that experience are constant, peaceful, and safe. I realized that the stress I carried about transforming the world is only another expression of what created that imbalance in the first place, the cult of progress in which peace hinges on constant growth. 
San Pedro showed me what indigenous cultures have known all along, that it's not about fundamentally changing, but about balancing. San Pedro is a living artifact of ancient times. In my view, even more useful than ceramics or carved stones for truly stepping into the minds and the hearts of ancient Andean cultures. I see plant medicines today as the swinging door between many worlds, new science and spirituality, um, environmentalism and humanism, the ancient and the modern, uh, reconciling polarized thinking in ourselves and by extension in our culture. So if indeed the world of San Pedro was the inspiration for the world of the Andes, uh, 